Welcome to Test Your Network, an Expo podcast aimed at helping you leverage our expertise in network testing and monitoring. Through guest interviews, trending discussion topics, and more, you'll gain actionable insights about successfully deploying next-gen networks, including 5G. Welcome to the Market Scale Software and Electronics Podcast. I'm your host, Shelby Scarhawk. Today, we are sitting down with Maury Wood, Business Development Manager for North American Key Accounts of Expo. Maury, welcome. Thanks, Shelby. So today, we're talking about dense wavelength division multiplexing for 5G deployment. Say that five times fast. It's a mouthful. I understand that you come from a semiconductor background before joining Expo, but before even that, before even getting into the technology sector, you got degrees in computer engineering and what else? Yeah, I also um, did five years in university and got a music degree as well. So sort of a nice compliment to the to the tech stuff was to be able to go off and play my bass. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was a, a, nice, a nice balance for me. So this was a way to assure that you got the dual degree in case your dreams of a rock star aspirations didn't take off. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and in fact, they did not. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you did find your way to Expo. Uh, so tell me a little bit about how you got there and what were some of the early challenges that you faced uh, when you got there? Yeah. So as you said, I, I did spend many, many years in the semiconductor industry and the sort of the, the gateway there was that the projects I worked on were related to communications technology. So sort of initially, you know, dial up modems to date myself a little bit and then through broadband wireline modems and then uh, that uh, the, the sort of the high ground here for communications is optical technology. And I managed through some other uh, connections to uh, join a competitor of Expo, but in the, in, the, in the optical test equipment world, and that's led to my, my role at Expo. But yeah, you know, it's, it's what's interesting, I find actually, in, in terms of uh, some of the challenges, or, or I guess I would, I would say one of the reasons why I think that background in in wireline, you know, older copper-based uh, broadband technology um, carries over is because it turns out that a lot of the same, I think surprisingly, at least for me, surprisingly, a lot of the same algorithms and things that are used in things like DSL and in cable modems, which are based in copper uh, media, carry over right into the optical domain. And so, in fact, uh, from a signal processing perspective, it's really quite quite similar. So the that background is, has been a, a good foundation for the work I'm doing now with Expo. Absolutely. Well, working in the industries that you have, obviously in the technology sector, cost is always a pervasive factor in bringing something like 5G to the mainstream. So will you kind of give us a primer on what Expo does in terms of bringing DWDM kind of more mainstream? Sure, absolutely. Wave division multiplexing has been a technology that's been around since I think the, if I'm not mistaken, the 80s, something like that, when the first uh, demonstrations were made. And the, the, to make things simple here, the, the beautiful thing about, about light and about, about sound too, and I think I can make the analogy using sound, it goes back to my music background is that, you know, our ears are able to hear simultaneously low sounds and, you know, high frequency sounds, which of course is why music and other things are, are so beautiful to us. And it's the same thing with light, whether that's going through the atmosphere and into our eyes or laser light in, in glass fiber. It turns out that different frequencies of light don't mix, don't interfere with each other. And so if you're carrying information on a lower frequency or higher wavelength of light, you can pass that without any sort of interference with a, a higher frequency or, or light wave and be able to recover those at the far end without any interference and be able to exploit that, that characteristic. And so in, in the case of, of wave division multiplexing, you're literally multiplexing different wavelengths of light on the same fiber. And there's a couple of different flavors of that. There was a coarse, so-called coarse wave division multiplexing in which the wavelengths are, occupy more spectrum, optical spectrum on that fiber. And then dense wave division, wavelength division multiplexing uses much more narrowly spaced lasers. But it, it turns out that even if only separated by 
by nanometers uh, of, of wavelength that again, as long as you've designed the system properly, those different wavelengths can be recovered and the information modulated on those uh, light waves can be received and recovered without any sort of problem at great lengths, at great distances, up to, say, 80 or 100 kilometers. And so the, the this has been around for a while. The technology has been uh, feasible. It has been used in core networks really for decades now. And I think that going coming back to your question with respect to cost, uh, 5G is driving a lot of different uh, sort of consumer level promises of higher bandwidth, uh, lower latency, uh, which is sort of the delay one experiences with different services on the internet, uh, better connectivity and coverage. But um, those things come at sort of the price of needing to have optical networks um, that service the radio base stations for 5G wireless that have a lot more bandwidth. And, And so that presents a big cost element to the big companies, the big communications companies these days, or not telephone companies so much, to provide those services. And so there's there's really two ways, I think this is pretty intuitive, that you can get more uh, bandwidth to these radio base stations for 5G. One of them is sort of the blunt approach of just burying uh, and stringing more optical cable to provide more fibers over which you can carry more more information. But the The nice thing is that the alternative to that, and I should just say before I go on, it's not only just the cost of those cables and the labor involved in establishing those cables, Shelby, but it's also the fact that those cables, particularly in urban areas, you know, impact people. They impact them with respect to having to dig up, you know, retrenching and yeah, and and, and getting the rights of way, the municipal rights of way. To do all that work, uh, it's extremely labor intensive. And in many cases, it's not even just that it takes money to do that. It takes time. And of course, in our business world, time is money. And there is a great deal of pressure on these major wireless uh, service providers to get 5G services into, into the hands of their customers. And so the, this is where the, the idea of, of wavelength division multiplexing comes along. Most fibers in the world, in the, on the planet, these days are carrying probably you know one or two wavelengths but with the right transmission equipment on both ends you can take existing fibers that serve uh, these radio base stations and then start to think about multiple wavelengths you know four eight or or more this these standards actually support up to a hundred um, uh, in some cases uh, different wavelengths on a single fiber and so all of a sudden you have a great deal more capacity to be able to deliver the the bandwidth required for 5G. Now, the rub has been historically, up until just recently, really, that uh, the transmission equipment that I mentioned in order to get uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing working on these fibers has been too costly. And so that's why we've only seen this technology applied to core networks. But what we're seeing now, and this kind of relates back to my sort of semiconductor background, um, of course, um, the 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 reason that we all walk around with pocket-sized computers that are more powerful than the computer used to land, uh, you know, <laughs> astronauts on the moon just, yeah, just 30, or no, I guess uh, more than 30, but more than 50 years ago. Um, the, reason for, the reason that we can all afford that is because of the amazing cost uh, reductions that have been enabled by integrated circuits, whether, and, and of course, in that case, it's it's electronic integrated circuits, but there's been sort of a quiet revolution of optical integrated functionality that's been occurring, and and that's enabled, you know, the internet to be to, to offer us the kind of capacity that we currently enjoy. But those innovations continue, and there's really tremendous levels of investment going on at the component level. And the reason I mention that is that the going back to to my brief description there of of wavelength division multiplexing, you need to have these different wavelengths, and that in this case. The relationship I'm referring to is the the lasers that are required to generate those different wavelengths. Those now, uh, where in the past they were cost prohibitive, um, and also the receiver technology led to the use of this sort of magical wave wavelength division multiplexing only in core networks where the very very highest bandwidth was required to get to data centers and things like that. At the component level, those have come down so much now that we're able to 
or that we will see those components being used in these access networks that connect right out to these radio base stations. And that component level sort of cost revolution, that re remarkable decrease in the cost of those components means now that uh, it is feasible to use DWDM uh, in these access networks for, for 5G. And that's really very, very exciting. And furthermore, uh, Exfo and, and others are making available the test equipment that enables these companies and the technicians that, uh, that, test, that install and test these networks to say, yes, you know, we have a good DWDM connection into these base stations and, and everything is working fine. So that's, that's kind of the theme here is the economic magic, the components are enabling so that this technology will allow this more rapid deployment without having to string up a lot of new cables for 5G. Right. Well, I think you started to hit on this about the ROI of offering DWDM to, to bring these, for simplicity's sake, these different wavelengths through the the network to be able to to offer that to consumers. I guess I have two questions in that. I mean, what is the thing that most people don't understand about DWDM in terms of, uh, you know, somebody that is trying to to grasp how accessible it's become now versus before? Like, you know, that could that comparison of when it was really not feasible to now it's possible. Right. So I, I think the, the best illustration of that comes with the knowledge of, of some of the new optical transceiver technologies that are becoming available. There's a new standard called 400ZR, which is uh, based on a technology called coherent trans transmission. I'm not going to get into that. That's not the subject here at all. But it, it is a, a, a technology which has the, the reach. So for example, 400ZR is specified for 400 gigabit per second Ethernet out to 80 kilometers, which is plenty long enough, even for you know the most remote small cell or macro cell base stations for 5G deployment. So there's plenty of reach. Uh, 400 gigabits per second is plenty of bandwidth. The links these days now, the industry's kind of moved from 10 gigabit per second sort of per antenna sector out to 25 gigabits per second. So with 400, you have you have eight streams that can go out on a single fiber over a 400 ZR link. And, and the reason that's possible is because, again, these 400 ZR optical transceivers use these new sort of cutting edge technologies, including these low cost, high volume, thermally stable semiconductor lasers that, that can create all these different wavelengths. So the, the volume associated with, with things like 400 ZR which is seen to be uh, having a great fit for both data center interconnect, but also on, on this so-called client side, where you're connecting uh, base stations. That's going to drive the, the economic, you know, the numbers, you know, the, just the economy of scale is going to drive that down. And so I think that coming back to your question, what do people don't understand? I think that unless you're paying close attention to some of these new trends, I think that it that based on sort of history, you'd, the commonly held assumption among among technologists would be, oh, you know, we can't afford to to use DWDM in these access networks, and I think that's what's changing. Again, Exfo is offering the tools to be able to test those networks, and so all the pieces are kind of falling into place to make this possible. And I think that's coming at this sort of ideal time, right at the beginning of the massive deployment of 5G, where you just need to have all this capacity. And here it is. It's all ready to go for the mass market. Uh, let me ask you something, a little bit of a philosophical question. You said that, you know, the consumer level demand is there for 5G. Is it a little bit of the chicken and the egg? Because do you think, in your opinion, do you think consumers understand the step up that they would see on their end from 4G to 5G and, and really grasp what a difference that is? Or is it the largely the telecom companies? kind of creating a demand for it, informing consumers that this newer, faster, shinier thing is available. So it's a little bit of a industry-led demand, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, I, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, there has been, I would, I would actually even use the word hype. I think there is a lot of consumer level hype about it. I think that I suspect the, the average consumer, you know, smartphone user doesn't really care terribly. I think that, so I do think it's somewhat industry driven. Of course, we've seen this 
you know, every time. And people still would like to have, you know, better coverage. They'd like to have, they'd like to be able to use the latest sort of apps that, you know, increasingly are video driven. And I think that 5G will do a fantastic job with that. I do think, and I think most sort of analysts that are looking into this kind of would say, you know, the impact isn't going to be necessarily felt so much at the consumer level, you know, people running around with their smartphones as much as the internet of things or what people are, are some, some people are calling the, the internet of, of everything where the opportunity with 5G to have, you know, anything that has, <laughs> that makes sense. And, and I'm sure in many cases, it doesn't make sense to connect to the internet, you know, will be uh, technically possible to do. So you'll see just a, a great deal of connectivity. But I think the areas where that really matters are industrial applications where you, you know, really does make sense to have, you know, b- having the ability to monitor, you know, process and do process control, you know, in every element of a factory or, you know, other things in the home monitoring energy use and, you know, uh, video doorbells and, and all kinds of things. But I think the other one, the big, I think the elephant in the room, so to speak, and something that I think there is consumer interest and, and in some cases enthusiasm for is autonomous cars. And you need to have high bandwidth, dense coverage, you know, for cars that are zipping around and communicating in real time on a peer to peer basis, you know, car to car, but also car to network to make sure that, yeah, you know, we, we know where the, the crashes are, if there are any with autonomous cars, you know, which of course there will be because it's gonna be a long time before all cars are autonomous. But it's gonna be, I think, those sort of applications where it isn't really something that you as a consumer are aware of. You just know that you're gonna get from point A to point B without having to drive and, and you'll be able to do it safely. And that's gonna be not just the car itself being able to navigate um, itself with the cameras and sensors, but also that it'll be communicating across these 5G networks. So I think that's where, you know, when people at the national levels, and there's almost a nationalism sort of about the importance of this technology, that's where they, they get excited is that it really does enable these these giant, you know, trillion dollar businesses to to thrive. We just know that from experience, the bandwidth uh, wireless bandwidth is just a key enabler of that sort of business uh, growth. So I think that's really where the, the the big deal stuff happen. Yeah, yeah. And I can, you know, just by the sheer volume of, of mentions of 5G during Super Bowl commercials, <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. But uh, but yeah, I think it's more the invisible things that will make the biggest impact with 5G versus you know, being able to to stream your your YouTube videos faster. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I think I'm sure that one of the things that was shown I didn't actually watch, but the the you know, okay, you can see the action you know on your on your tablet from you know five different cameras simultaneously and that sort of thing. And I think you know those are good almost for a sort of a technology demonstration. Like, yeah, this is incredibly capable. And I think that it is hard. And I think every time we have a a turn of the page in terms of these new technologies. Nobody really knows where it's going to go, and 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 yet, and so we look back. So of course, you know, five G was critical for that. We, but you know, like TikTok. I mean, who who knew, right? I mean, it's exactly. like these brand these brand new things that that nobody really anticipated. And so I think that's that's. Uh, I think that at this point in time, after you know, fifty years of this continuous sort of uh, technology, um, you know, evolution, evolution, people start taking it on faith that yeah, okay, we know we're going to need more bandwidth. Let's get the pipes in place. And that's what Expo does. I mean, we make we're the company that makes sure that when those those uh, these these communications companies make these big investments in these networks, that we supply them with the equipment that they can use then to to assure that they're delivering the performance that um, they're that they're hoping to get from those networks. And so that's our role. And uh, as I said earlier, we we have some terrific uh, instruments. I'm not going to go into detail that will allow things like. DWDM to be used in access networks, and we're very excited about the potential for that. I kind of see it as, uh, you know, building the roads and the highways uh, before the traffic jams start. So in in high growth areas, you know, you know there's going to be more cars, more people, more access needed. And so instead of waiting for those backups to occur, they are are forward looking and, and seeing where those roads need to be. Exactly. Isn't it nice that in at least this one case, you know, there are people, there are a lot of people focused on trying to solve the future, the future problems as opposed to waiting for those problems to, to inundate us before we try to solve them. So no, I think it's, I think you're absolutely right. And of course, it's good business as well. I mean, that's, it's, this isn't all, all charity work. It's, it's because those are going to drive a ton of, you know, just un, almost unimaginable levels of economic uh, development across these, the, the economies of the world. So it's, it's a big deal. And it's, it's like you said, it's proactive. It's, 
it's moving things in the right direction. And, and uh, uh, you know, thankfully, the, the tools and, and the technologies are in place to make all this work. Well, fantastic stuff. I really enjoyed the conversation today, Maury. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Shelby. I appreciate it. And that does it for this episode of the Software and Electronics Podcast. Until next time, I'm Shelby Skirhawk. Thank you.